We come back to our study in the Gospel of Luke. And as we begin this today, I, I want to just share as a dad, and you guys are parents, many of you, but um, for like many of you, my kids, I would say, are my life. Would you say that about, about your kids? And uh, you get that because you are created in the image of God. And uh, what, so in our family, we have 12 kids, and I've shared that before. But what you may not know is that in our family, we were in diapers for 17 straight years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, some of those uh, diapers, we would call them poopy diapers. Uh, is it okay for me to say poopy diapers in church today? Because I'm, I'm going to. So, but, uh, so 17 years in diapers, and... and um, when we finally came to the, the last three of ours, ours being uh, potty trained, there were the last three, if we can put the picture up. But uh, this is Hunter, Justice, and Sunday. Sunday's in the middle there. And uh, they're 12 years old now. And, and if, if they would kill me if they knew that I was putting this picture up here. But, but uh, so there they were. And, and um, this is, I think, 2013, 2014 or so. But can you imagine when you look at them, if I were to take these three little guys, as with all my kids, and I were to drop them off at a babysitter's house and I say, I'm, I'm leaving them with you. I'm going to go away for a while, but then I'm going to come back and I'm going to get them. Can you imagine if those babysitters, that babysitter were to say something to my three little guys I represent your dad, and you have been pooping in your diaper, you poopy diapers everywhere, and I want you to know that the foul stench of your poopiness has reached the nostrils of your father, and he is upset. He is fed up with your poopiness. How dare you continue in your poopiness? This has to stop. He is done with your poopiness. So they they represent me to my kids in this way, and then I go and I pick up my kids later on, and instead of them running to me, they run from me because now they're terrified because they think that I'm mad at them. And I, I look at them and I see that they're crying. I'm like, guys, what's, what's up with that? And I find out that they're running from me because somebody claimed to represent me in a way that caused them to run from me as opposed to to me. Uh, if they were told that, you know, your dad is mad and he does not accept you because of all your poopiness. Well, guys, the truth is my kids are my life. I get that from being created in the image of God. Nothing else in the creation could care less how somebody uh, represents, you know, the, the, the parent to the, to the children. So how do you think I'm going to respond to somebody who would do that and claim to represent me to my children? Now, I, I want them to become potty trained over time when it's appropriate, but parents, wouldn't you agree that we kind of knew before we had kids that there'd be poopy diapers involved? I mean, we just kind of knew that. That's just part of it. So that doesn't really bother us, you know, but we just knew that. But I would become unglued if somebody misrepresented me to my kids in a way that, that, would, that would cause them to run from me as opposed to to me. So I get that from being created in the image of God and I notice as I go through the Bible how seriously God takes when people claim to represent him to God's children and they represent him in a way that causes his children to run from him as opposed to to him. So it's so important to God that he's represented right so that all the way back in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, they've come out of Egypt and God knows that if people, the religious people, they misrepresent God to the people, they're gonna have a very skewed view of who God really is. So God comes to the priests of, of Israel through Moses and he says this there in your outline. I want you to underline a few things as we go through this. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his son saying, thus you shall bless. You want to underline the word bless. You shall bless the people of Israel and you shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall, or that's how, they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. So God comes to the priest and says, this is how you're to represent me in front of the people. So God wanted his reputation to be um, uh, communicated in, in that way. So you sort of get from that, if God's saying that, he's not angry with the people. Would you agree with that? He says, I just bless them and his face shine upon you. Well, I put there on your outline numbers 20, I can't, uh, I couldn't put the whole passage there, but I, I do want to tell you the story. God takes this so serious that there's Moses and he's leading God's people out of Egypt and uh, he's God's man. He's in charge. He's the representative of God to the people. And so they, they come out of Egypt and they come to a place where there's no water. The people are thirsty and uh, they're, they're thirsty and they're becoming cranky because they have no water to drink. So let me ask you parents a question. Uh, have you noticed that when your kids are hungry and thirsty that they get a little cranky? I mean, we, we, we get that, right? That's just what they do. They're just kids. So God knows that, and God goes to Moses and says, Moses, here's what I want you to do. This is going to be great. I want you to go out. There's a rock out there. I want you to go speak to the rock, and when you speak to the rock, water's going to come out of the rock, and it's going to refresh all the people. But Moses is angry at the people because they're cranky. So now Moses is cranky uh, towards the people. And so Moses goes out, instead of speaking to the rock, he goes out and he looks at the people and he goes, you have rebelled against God. And he's tired of the, you know, on and on. I'll let you read it. But he's very angry. And then instead of speaking to the rock, he grabs a stick and he whacks it. Whack, whack. And in that, the people are now terrified uh, because now they think that God is angry. Now, the good news is that water comes out, but now the people think that God is angry, not because God's angry, but because of the way that Moses has just represented God to the people. So God comes to Moses and he says, Moses, because you did that, you can no longer lead my people. There on your outline, it says, but the Lord said, and this is the end of that passage, but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, since you did not trust me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, for that reason you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. You see, striking the rock in anger misrepresented God to the people. And for Moses, it cost him his leadership of, of leading the people. God says, you cannot represent me in that way. So here's the warning. Please write this down. We have to be careful how we represent him. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus described it like this. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Heavy words from Mr. Forgiveness, wouldn't you agree? And so the idea is he takes the representation of himself very seriously. So today, we've called this some perspective on God's perspective when people misrepresent him to his children. So as our story picks up today, Jesus is going to be uh, in this argument with some religious leaders and he's cast out a demon. So I'm going to pick it up in verse 14. We're going to hop, skip, and jump a little bit as we go. Verse 14 of chapter 11, it says, he was casting out a demon and it was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the crowds were amazed. The people are amazed that this happens. But some, not the crowds, but some of them said, he casts out demons demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. So who's saying that you're doing this by Beelzebul? Now, Beelzebul is another idiom for Satan, Lord of the flies. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Well, when Matthew tells the story, Matthew gives us a little detail. Same story. Matthew says it like this. It says, when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul. So here you have the Pharisees are the one who's saying what Jesus is doing, it's really by Satan. That's what Satan is doing. Now, when you go through the Gospels and you come to the Pharisees, typically, would they be believers or unbelievers? 
Only like three of you got that one, but <laughs> typically they would be non-believers or unbelievers. So what we're going to find to set this up, write this down, Jesus is arguing with non-believers. And these non-believers, the Pharisees, they're going to be rejecting Jesus and they're going to be rejecting his message. But here's the thing, and I want you to write this down. <clears throat> they claim to represent God. They're rejecting him, but they claim to represent God. So down on verse 16, it says, others to test him were demanding of him a sign from heaven. Uh, he's just cast out a demon, but now, they, oh, we want a sign. We want another sign. Verse 23, skip all the way down. We were there in the, our last study. Jesus says, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me uh, scatters. So the idea is with Jesus, we talked about last time, there is no neutral ground. You're either with him or you're not with him. Now, it, the story continues and this argument's gonna heat up, but now there's like this little uh, intersection here, interlude, verses 27 and 28. I've put it on your outline. I think it's there for a reason. We'll talk about that later. But I put it on your outline from the New American just because it highlights something. There in your outline, it says, while Jesus was saying these things, what he's just said, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that wished you nursed. But he said, and I want you to underline, on the contrary, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. So she says this publicly, so Jesus has to deal with this publicly. And here, as Jesus says this, he's corrective. He's not argumentative. He's not mad at her. But he says, on the contrary. She points to Jesus' mom and he says, on the contrary, don't focus in on my mom. Focus in on the word of God and observing that. Jesus was concerned that if he didn't say something publicly, that people would begin to focus in on his mom, but they, they would then to lose, begin to lose focus on his word. Does that make sense? I know many of us come from a, a background that em emphasizes Jesus' mom. And if you come from that background, here's what you'll know. Coming here and going through the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, is very new to you because you, you don't typically do that in, in a church that would emphasize his mom. So Jesus here says, focus in on the word. She says it in her zeal. He's not mad. He just corrects her to make sure that people don't go in that direction. But Jesus has been in this argument with these religious leaders. So in verse 29, which is after that, it says, as the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign. He's not saying that to the crowds that are arriving. Uh, in the crowd that's there, they've just said, we want to see more signs. So the crowd's arriving. So he says that not to the crowd that's arriving. <clears throat> they seek for a sign. And yet no sign will be given it, but the sign of Jonah. So Jesus has just performed a very dramatic miracle. He's cast out a demon. And there are those there who say, we want more signs. They don't want Jesus. They just want more signs. And what you'll find is for those who seek signs, they don't, who, you know, they don't want Jesus. They just want more signs. But signs are never enough. <clears throat> so Jesus says, all right, well, I'm going to give you a sign. Verse 30, it says, for just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the son of man be to this generation. Now, you know the story of Jonah. He spends three days, three nights in the belly of a fish. And some people look at this and they point to the sign of Jonah is that after three days and three nights, he comes up out of the fish, literally vomited, we would assume there on the shores of Nineveh. And, and uh, he would be bleached completely white because of the stuff that's in the, the fish. And so some po people point to the sign as three days in the belly and then coming up from what we would consider dead. Others point to the sermon as the sign. I think it's, it's, it's all both. But when Jonah comes up and he goes to Nineveh, he preaches a sermon. It's very short. And he says, 40 days and then there is judgment. And when you read his sermon, again, it's very short. There's no signs in that. There's no grace in that. There's no miracles. And he gives the people of Nineveh no hope, no hope at all. He doesn't say if you repent, things could be different. 
But they, however, they do repent and God chooses to spare them. So they responded to Jonah's message. We'll talk about that in a minute. But there's someone such, so much greater than Jonah here, but they're not responding to his message. So then verse 31, it says, the queen of the south. Now in your Bibles, <clears throat> the queen of the south is also in the Old Testament known as the queen of Sheba. <clears throat> so you just know that. The queen of the south will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to, bear, to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So the queen of the south, we also know her as the queen of Sheba. She travels 1,200 miles to hear Solomon's wisdom, which would be a lesser wisdom than what Jesus is giving. But these guys, they have in their presence the greatest wisdom at, of, of all, and they're rejecting it. They're rejecting the message. They're rejecting everything about him. <clears throat> so verse 32, he says, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Now we miss it, but this is really irritating these Pharisees who are in this, in this crowd. Why? Well, here's what you need to know. Jonah preaches to the Ninevites, the queen of Sheba, she comes from the south. Write this down, the queen of Sheba and the Ninevites are Gentiles, they're Gentiles. And so they heard the message, they heard the wisdom and they received it. But these are supposed to be the ones who should receive, but they're rejecting the wisdom and they're rejecting uh, the message, they're not receiving. Verse 33, Jesus says, no one after lighting a lamp puts it away in a, in a cellar nor under a basket, but on a lampstand so that those may enter, those who enter may see the light. And uh, so very quickly write this down. My relationship with him is not private. It's not private. If you have that light in you, people are going to see that. And, uh, but keep in mind, he's speaking to hostile unbelievers here. So then verse 34 through 36, it continues, and it says, the eye is the lamp of your body, and your eye, when your eye is clear, your whole body also is full of light. But when it is bad, some of your Bibles might say evil, it's the same word, your body also is full of darkness. Then watch, Watch out that the light in you is not darkness. The light in you is not darkness. If therefore your whole body is full of light with no dark part in it, then you will be whole, it will be wholly illumined as when the lamp illumines you with its rays. Now, write this down, we'll unpack it. Here, uh, Jesus says the brightest light will not give light to those who are spiritually blind. And these people are spiritually blind. Uh, he tells them, you're rejecting me uh, because you are spiritually blind. You're not rejecting me because of who I am. You're rejecting me because of who you are. You see, if you're blind, you can have the greatest light around you, but it's not going to get in. Not because there's a problem with the light. There's a problem with your eye. It's the blindness. Does that make sense to you? So with that, so far, Jesus has told them that, you know, there's no neutrality with him. You're either gathering or scattering. You're the part of his or, or you're against him. Uh, the Gentiles would receive, but you won't receive. And then he tells them that they are spiritually blind. Now, this is infuriating them as, as he goes. Then verse 37, it says, now, when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him, and he went and he went in and reclined at the table. Now, there's a couple things we need to know. This is a Pharisee. So Pharisees typically, are they believers or unbelievers? Unbelievers. Okay. So what we're going to find here is this is not a sincere invitation. Everybody look down at verse 54. Verse 54, it's going to say, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. So we're going to find that by the time this is all over, they're actually trying to set him up. They, they want to kill him. So they want to kill Jesus, but they're offering food. Would you come over for lunch? Which tells us something about Jesus, which I think is important. Jesus never turns down food. It's like... <laughs> 
you want to kill me, I understand that, but, but what, what, what are you cooking? So he, so he goes. I know that there's a deep theological truth there, but I, I just, but uh, I appreciate that. So here becomes the confrontation. Jesus begins to confront those who claim to represent God to the people. Uh, they're not representing God to the people. In case we miss it, he is not happy. So I put verse 38 on your outline. I want to highlight something, so I put it on your outline. Now it says, when the Pharisee saw this, he was surprised, surprised that Jesus had not first ceremonially washed, the Greek word there is baptizo, before the meal. Now the reason I put this on your outline is because some of your Bibles leave out the ceremonially uh, uh, washed. They'll say washed. Uh, the word there, baptizo, means that this is something that you do by a, a ceremony. So what I want you to write down here, and it's important, and he's surprised, the, the, the Pharisee's surprised that Jesus doesn't do this elaborate ceremonial washing. Write this down. This washing was for ceremony, not for hygiene. So keep in mind, this is 2,000 years ago in the Middle East. This is not here in the United States, 2024. We wash our hands for hygiene. There, um, they, they might do that also, but this is a ceremonial washing that Jesus is not doing. Now, you'll find this, it's in uh, Exodus and it's in Leviticus. There were a few places, and I put the address there, Exodus 30, you can look it up later on. But God came to the priests at the temple and he said, when you do these certain services at the temple to the priests, before you do that, you need to ceremonially wash. Now this would be a very elaborate washing. And, and the, the point that, that needs to be made here is this was given again to the priest at the temple when they perform certain duties at the, at the temple. But it was never given to the people. It was never given to the people to, to do anything like that. But over time, someone began to say, well, you know, if the priests do this at the temple, maybe it would be a good idea for us to begin to wash our hands ceremonially, ritually, and, and so they began to do that. And it's a very elaborate washing, more than you just washing your hands for a meal. And so the people began to do this, and it became a tradition among the people to do this. And the people would look on, and they considered that those who did this must be very spiritual. I mean, look how they ceremonially washed their hands. But here's the problem. Uh, this was an extra biblical tradition that goes way beyond the Bible and God never told his people, the people, the average person to do anything like this. So I want you to write this down. Over time, what happened was tradition became elevated above God's word. It has nothing to do with God's word. It just was a tradition. Again, this was only given to the priest at the temple. And it became a way for people to climb the spiritual hierarchy. So the most religious people would do this and all the other people would look on and they would see this elaborate washing and they would say, you must be so spiritual. This was something that could be seen by other people. Well, it gets worse. Write this down. They judge someone's spiritual condition by their keeping of the tradition. It has nothing to do with what the Bible said. It just became a tradition. So in verse 38, again, it says, when the Pharisees saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. It's like, you don't, you don't wash? You don't do the whole ceremony thing uh, to, to, to be spiritual? You call yourself spiritual? Now, does it seem ridiculous to you that somebody would be judged spiritual or not spiritual based upon them washing their hands with an elaborate ritual? The answer is yes. It's ridiculous, okay? It's ridiculous. That's the idea. But wouldn't you agree that sometimes in church world we do the same thing? You know, we, we, if you, you know, come from a, I come from somewhat of a legalistic background as part of my church background. And what we do is we take our personal conviction and uh, we elevate it above Scripture. And then we judge other people based upon whether they keep my conviction or not. 
So in part of my church, my, my parents, we were one of those families that were in different churches at different times. And one of the churches that we, we um, joined you had to sign a covenant. And in that covenant, you had to say, I will never drink, dance, or smoke. And so, um, so you know, whether you do those things or not, you know, that's, that's between you and the Lord. But if you wanted to have fellowship with the believers in that church, that was a covenant that you had to sign. But the Bible doesn't say that you can't do those things, but that's how we had fellowship or not had fellowship with other people. Part of my church background, uh, you couldn't play cards. How many of you come from a church background or playing cards? I see that hand in the back. Is there another? Hands going up all over the auditorium for those of you listening online. So, and, and the logic would go like this. When people gamble, they use cards. Therefore, if you use cards, you are gambling, and so you cannot play cards. So I, I've never played cards. Um, others would have, you know, in the church I grew up in was mostly a wonderful church, but... Um, there was the debate about movies. Can you go to a G movie, a PG movie, R movie? You know, we know that some, okay, we're not gonna talk about those, but, but um, you know, could you go to certain movies? So I remember uh, when I was 13 years old, Jaws came out. And when Jaws came out, our youth leader came out and said, none of you are going to go see Jaws. And, and you know, you, we're just not, you don't go see Jaws. So I've never seen Jaws. How many of you have ever seen Jaws? Oh yeah, let me make it more simple. How many of you have never seen the movie Jaws? Okay, so the three of us, we, we've, we've, never, we've never seen the movie Jaws. Now, there may be some wisdom in, in some of that, I don't know, uh, because here's what I can tell you. I have some friends, they even go near the beach and they hear, Da, 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 da. <laughs> so, but I don't, I don't. But so maybe there was some wisdom in that, but that there's no Bible verse that says that you can't see Jaws. It becomes something that, you know, you have to decide. Uh, so prayerfully decide. So this Pharisee is judging other people uh, by his extra biblical standards and all his standards are gonna be standards that are externals you can see on the outside. It has nothing to do with the inside. But he claims to represent God. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can find ourselves doing the same thing. So let me just share with you our position here at Calvary, and hopefully this is uh, your position also. Um, here at Calvary, and this comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. I condensed it, but you'll get the point. Paul says, in us, you may learn, underline, not to exceed what is written. Don't go beyond what is written so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. So if you come from a church background, had all these rules, rituals, regulations, and you look at other people and they're not keeping your list that the Bible doesn't talk about, you become arrogant about them because you think, well, we're spiritual, but you're not doing these things, and so you are not spiritual. So we don't wanna do that. So we just say, what does the Bible say? I'm not going to go beyond what the Bible says. Well, sometimes people come and they say, Pastor, we know we want to do the right thing before the Lord, and we want to know if this is okay if we do this. Well, the first thing I would say to you if you're asking that question, uh, it's probably a no, but, but, but may, maybe not. But here's, here's how I'd want to respond to this. There on your outline, it says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Are you a child of God? Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Then you don't need to come to me. And you have his word, you have his spirit, go ask him. He wants to talk to you. So I'm not the conduit. So it's okay, go to him and see what he says to you. Because on that day that we stand before the Lord, you can't say, well, here's what Dan said. <laughs> He's a, Did Dan die on the cross for your sins? No, you know, so you go to him. Does that make sense to you? Good, good, good. So here's this Pharisee. He's judging Jesus by these non-biblical externals. So let's see how Jesus feels about this. Verse 39, it says now, um, verse 39, when the Lord said to him, let me read 38. The Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, now 
you, you Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside you're full of robbery and wickedness. You want to underline, he's warming up the crowd, making a friend, that sort of thing. And then verse 40, he goes, you foolish ones, you foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside too? So they placed a tremendous emphasis on what you could see on the outside, and they thought that was what made you spiritual. Jesus calls them fools for doing that. He says, you focus on the outside, but on the inside, you're just full of wickedness. So it's sort of like this, the way that I envision this uh, by way of illustration. You go to a restaurant and the wait staff comes out and they bring you this glass of ice water and the outside is very clean. The water is clear on the inside. You got the ice cubes, but you notice that there's a dead roach in there just kind of swirling around. Are you going to drink that? So they would say, yeah, but the outside's what's most important. We would say, no, I'm not drinking the roach. So that's the the idea. So then Jesus goes on, verse 41, and he says, but give that which is within. Hopefully your Bible has the word within, within, uh, as charity, and then all things are clean to you. What you notice about God is that God cleans from the inside out. Religion always focuses in on the external, the outside, what people can see. I personally, some people are offended by this, but I'm personally refreshed when somebody comes to the Lord and they come up to me and they share all that God is doing in their life. They're brand new to the Lord and they're using language that I don't typically use. And they come and say, you know, this following Jesus has been just so blankety blank, 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 amazing. I just love him and all the blankety blank, blank, blank stuff that he's doing in my life. That, that bothers some people, but I'm sometimes refreshed in that because here's what I know. Something's happening on the inside. They're going to continue to grow in the Lord. God's going to clean some things up, but he's going to clean them up from the inside out, not the outside in. Does that make sense to you? And hopefully you're okay with that. Are you okay with that? Good, good, good. All right, well, verse 42, the plot thickens and it says, but woe to you Pharisees. All right, so when Jesus gives a woe, is this a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. You know, the word woe, when you look it up, means denouncing, it means misery or disaster. You know, it's one of those angry words. So he says, but woe to you Pharisees. You tithe, you pay the tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden or herb and yet disregard justice and the love of God, but these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. What they would do in order to look spiritual, these Pharisees, the very religious people, they would go into their garden and they'd get out their leaves and they'd count to every 10th leaf and they would snip it and they'd put that in a little, little cup or something like that. And then after they went through their garden taking every 10th leaf as a tithe, Then they would walk to the temple where everybody could see, I tithe all the way down to the bushes in my garden. And people would look on and they would say, because everybody could see them doing this, they, oh, you must be so spiritual that you do that all the way down to the leaves in your garden. Well, another translation says it like this, a more updated, it says, but woe to you Pharisees, for though you are careful to tithe even the smallest part of your income, you completely forget about the justice of God. He says, you should tithe, yes, but you should not leave these other things undone. So both are good. They focused in on one side, but you gotta focus in on both sides. Verse 43, he continues and he says, But woe, one more woe to you Pharisees. You love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. There were these elaborate greetings based upon where you were in the spiritual hierarchy. But write this down. Their deepest motivation was to be the center of attention in spiritual settings. Now, we, we do the same thing uh, in, in church world sometimes. You know, we, we point to the titles. You know, bishop, apostle, evangelist, doctor, reverend. And I could tell you some stories on that. But for me, I'm just going to stick with, good morning, my name is... Dan, and that's as far as I'm going to, you call me whatever you want, um, but you know, you, you see these titles, you know, the exalted, high, holy, reverend, and all that, which is what I think of myself on the inside, but I'm just going to stick, 
So, but these people, they didn't care about changed lives. They just cared about how people perceived them as being spiritual. Verse 44, Woe, once again, to you, for you're like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. We miss this in our culture, but in those days, people would come to Jerusalem, they would come to worship, and when you went to the temple, you had to be ceremonially clean. And so, in order to be ceremonially clean, if you were to like touch a tomb, step on a tomb, on the way into town, even though you've traveled from a very long distance, that would make you ceremonially unclean and you couldn't go into the temple. So what they would do is they would go out before the holidays and they would paint all the tombs with this whitewash so it would, it would appear, so everybody would know well, this is a tomb and you don't want to touch it. Jesus says, you're like these dead tombs and because the people, they, they touch these things and it just defiles them. But when people come to you uh, and you, they come in contact with you, you just defile them because they don't even realize how dead you are. And so they think they're coming to you for help, but what you're really doing is you're just defiling them. Well, verse 45, it goes on. He says, now one of the lawyers said to him in reply, teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. Um, this would have been a good time for the lawyer to just be quiet, but, but, but he can't do it. And he says, you insult us too. Now that's important. Everybody here, everybody there recognized that Jesus was openly insulting these people to their face. They get it, they get it. So verse 45, he says, you, you lawyer said to him uh, in reply, teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. Now, the religious uh, lawyers, what they did, they claimed to represent God also, but they were the ones who went through the Old Testament law, specifically the first five books of the Bible, certainly the whole book, but, but the first five books. And they would determine what it meant to keep the rules or to not keep the rules, and they had all of these elaborate rules, rituals, and things that, that uh, they did. So verse 46, it says, uh, verse 46, but he said, he said, woe to you lawyers as well, for you weigh, you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So it was the religious lawyers that were making it very hard for the people to follow God. Uh, again, these elaborate rules that they put on people. So let me just give you one illustration, and there are hundreds, uh, but one illustration is this. The religious lawyers would say, um, if you need water on the Sabbath, you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. So if you need water, you can't tie a rope to a bucket, put it into the well, and pull that up. Now you can't do that because that would be work. Okay, so everybody got that. And then they said, but wait a minute, a woman is able to tie her sash, her girdle as they would call it, uh, with the rope that went around her body. She's allowed to do that on the Sabbath. Therefore, if you need water from a well, you can't do that, but a woman can take the rope that she would tie around her clothing because she's allowed to tie that rope on the Sabbath. She could tie that to a bucket, put that into the water, and then pull that up, and that would be okay. Does that sound ridiculous to anybody else other than me? Yeah, so it was all of these elaborate things that, that, that you had to, to know. And, and we look on and we go, that's just the craziest thing ever. So then it, Jesus says, but you don't, you, know, you don't put any of these things on yourself. They would find loopholes that excluded them from those same things. So I want you to just very quickly notice the difference. Think about your church background and uh, notice the difference, what they're putting onto the people here, these religious lawyers. And I want you to notice what Jesus says there on your outline in Matthew. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Now, where you have that space there, I want you to write the word teaching. The yoke for a rabbi was his teaching. And that's a simplified form, but that's the idea of what it means. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest, rest for your souls, 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So in this battle with these religious leaders, these religious lawyers, right down, they made following God a burden, a burden with all of their non-biblical rules, rituals, regulations, and all those nuances. But Jesus said, it's supposed to bring rest, supposed to bring rest. Um, I can tell you, and I know that uh, many of us come from church backgrounds, I have friends that I grew up with that ultimately walked away from the Lord because the Christianity that we were given was so hard to follow. There were so many rules, rituals, regulations that my friends looked on and said, I can't do it, I can't do it. Jesus says it's supposed to be easy. It's supposed to bring rest. So evaluate in your Christianity, has it brought you rest? Is it easy or is it a burden? I would suggest to you if it's a burden, you need to look at that. It might not be the gospel here in the New Testament. Jesus continues verse 47, he says, woe to you for you build the tombs of the prophets and it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses and approve of the deeds of your fathers because it was they who killed them and you build their tombs. These people honored their fathers, we would say ancestors, but their fathers killed the prophets. Um, And here they are, they're honoring Jesus by inviting him over for lunch, but they're planning on killing him. We'll see that as we go. Verse 49, he says, for this reason, also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles. That's going forward. That's not Old Testament, that's New Testament. And some of them they will kill and some they will persecute so that the blood of all the prophets since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it will be charged against this generation. They honored their ancestors, but their ancestors killed the prophets. Prophets in the Bible were not typically honored in their own generation. So the prophet would come along, the people would say, well, you're just a man, you don't really have a message, we don't embrace your message. And then they would kill the prophets. When you go through the Bible, you've all heard of the book of Isaiah, a very large book, uh, covers a great deal of Bible prophecy. The way that Isaiah died was the religious people sawed him in half. That's how he died. And that's typically how prophets died, either being stoned or whatever, something like that. But then that would happen. But the next generation would say, we think that guy was a prophet. And and so then they would begin to honor that one that their fathers killed. So that's the idea. Verse 52, he says, woe to you lawyers for you have taken away the key. Uh, You have taken away the key of knowledge and you yourselves do not enter and you hindered those who were entering. I've underlined you do not enter. Yourselves do not enter. And you have hindered those who were entering. These religious leaders, they thought that they had the key of knowledge. But what they had caused them to not enter into. They're not going to be part of God's kingdom. By and large, some of them will later on. Uh, But what's even worse about that is by what they were doing, they were causing other people to not enter into God's kingdom. Uh, There, when he says the key of knowledge, uh, there are different understandings of this, what that can mean. I'm going to share with you my perspective. I'm not going to say emphatically that it's right. But I would hold that the key of knowledge is the word of God. It's the word of God. The lawyers there, the religious lawyers, removed the word of God. They focused in on their man-made traditions, rules, rituals, regulations that the Bible had not spoken of. And uh, you remember the lady who yelled, how blessed is the womb that bore you? And Jesus says, don't focus in on my mom, focus in on the word. I wonder if that little story is inserted right there out of the flow just to remind us that it all comes down to his word. We need to point to his word. So I, I would hold that. I'm not emphatic, but, but uh, that's how I would hold that. But I want you to write this down. Notice they didn't enter. They didn't enter. They're not going to be part of God's kingdom. They weren't believers at all, but they claimed to represent God. 
and they hindered other people from actually coming to the Lord. Verse 53, it says, when they left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something that he might say. So this, they want to kill him, essentially. So I began, and we bring this to a close, I began by showing pictures of my children. And I asked, how would I feel if somebody misrepresented me to my children in a way that when I came to get my children, instead of running to me, they ran from me. And now they're in terror of me, not because of who I am, but because of how I've been represented to them by somebody who claimed to represent me. Well, again, as parents, we would be very upset uh, and we get that from being created in the image of God. As we, by the way, did you find that helpful today? Yeah. Good, good, good. So, <laughs> so, if I can say this without emotion, as we bring this to a close, there are some of us in this room, you have not embraced Jesus as your savior and, and entered into a relationship with him. Not because of who he is, but because of how he has been represented to you. And in that representation, you said, I don't want that. Can I just suggest to you that the reason he created you in the first place is because he wanted to have a relationship with you. That's why you're here. He wants to have a relationship with you. So I'm going to close in prayer. And as I do, for those of us here who've walked away, because not because of who he is, but how he's been represented to us, I want to give you the opportunity to invite Jesus in. And as he steps in, I encourage you as you grow in your relationship with him, find out who he is and leave behind, leave behind some of that representation from some of the people who claim to represent him to us. Can we do that? So let's pray. Father, as we bring this to a close today, um, I know that there are those in this room who have walked away from you, not because of who you are, but because of how you've been represented to, to us and to them. And so, Lord, today, as we went through this, you've opened some eyes, realizing that may, maybe the representation of you wasn't completely accurate. And so for those of us here in that position, we say, Jesus, I'm inviting you to come into my life. Thank you for forgiving me of everything I have ever done. I want that relationship with you. And if you invite him in, it's very simple. He's forgiven you. He loved you. He created you. He wanted to have a relationship with you. He knew all the things that you would ever do. He came and he paid the price for all of those things. And now he wants that relationship with you so that you can become everything that he's designed you to be so that you can walk with him and have eternity with him after this life. But he wants that relationship. And if you've invited him today, it's the best decision that you've ever made and and. Just know this, you'll never meet somebody who's made that decision, walked with the Lord for a long time, who will ever say, that's the dumbest thing I ever did. That never happens. But if that's you today and you've invited Jesus in, please let somebody know before you leave here today. Lord, keep us till we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. We love you. We'll see you next time.